Christmas is only seven days away. And today, finally, our traditional scripture passage brings us to the story of Jesus' birth. Oh, we have waited so long for this day, haven't we? But, but that's kind of the point, isn't it? Because life is in the waiting. Faith is in the waiting. And waiting, well, waiting can get a little bit messy. What we can't control, messy. Our stories, messy. Our faith, our doubts, messy. Today, we're going to look at how our call from God to be different also makes life messy. We've said it before, you know, it doesn't seem uh, like God is too worried about messy. In fact, it seems like God does some of his best work through them, in and through the messy, right? Mary and Joseph, I think, might be the first to attest to that. There are two accounts of Jesus' birth, one in Matthew and one in Luke. The one in Matthew goes like this. Now, the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be pregnant from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to divorce her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had given birth to a son. And he named him Jesus. (laughs) Talk about messy. A fiancé, pregnant, and it's not your child. The hurt and the anger would be enough, but, but then there's the public embarrassment, the shame. And in the faith tradition of the time, the religious law and its very harsh demands. Messy, messy, messy. We know this story so well, don't we? In fact, we know it so well that I think sometimes it loses its impact, right? We hear the beginning of the story and in our minds we quickly say, yes, yes, angel visits, virgin birth, you shall name him Jesus. And then we quickly jump over the messy part to the joyful, uh, precious infant baby Jesus in the manger. And, and we are hurrying to remember Mary, meek and mild and gentle, blessed mother of Jesus, the one who said yes. We gloss over the messy parts, right? But for these two faithful people and their families, it was extremely messy, this thing that God had asked them to do. Let's look at their story for a few minutes, shall we? Really look at it. Mom, Dad, I'm pregnant. Now, I know what you're thinking, and it's not that Joseph and I have done what is right, or or that's to say Joseph and I have not done what is wrong. There was an angel. He said it was God's child, really. He said, he said, um, it was, he said, he said it was God's child, really. Believe me. I'm not making this up. And then the same conversation with Joseph. Really, I've been faithful to you. Please believe me. <laughs> Messy, right? What parent, what, what fiancé wants to hear that news? And perhaps worse, 
in a small town. I mean, think about it. We live in a small town here in Portland, right? We know what that life is like. Everybody knows everybody and everybody knows everybody else's business. Now, sometimes that's a good thing, right? There's security in knowing everyone. There's an understanding of the expectations that keep us all safe and comfortable, right? And there's the shared history that we're proud of. But there's also the not so great parts, right? Like the pressure to conform, the gossip, the judgment. How often does the announcement of an unplanned teen pregnancy go over well? At least at first, right? It's not the scandal it once was, to be sure, but it still comes with its judgments and its harsh realities. Now, while it's a large city today, Nazareth was a very small town when Mary's family lived there, 300-ish people or so. It's fairly safe to assume then that the next day when Mary got up and went about her, her usual day, there would have been a lot of looks and a few tisk tisks from people standing in doorways, right? The odds are very small that the village would have put up a banner over Main Street saying, Welcome to Nazareth, future home of God's only son. Not likely happening. It reminds me of another small town in one of Jesus' stories that, that Luke recorded. The story went something like this. We don't know very much, or we don't know much of anything really about uh, the father and son or what it was that, that brought them to odds with each other. All we know is that there was a man who had two sons and one of those sons had come to the dad asking him to give him his share of the inheritance. Now, however tame that may sound for us today on that day in that place, the son was essentially saying, I have had enough. Give me what's meant to be mine. I wish you were dead. Messy, right? Now, we don't know the father's thoughts as he was dividing up things, if he was sad or disappointed or if he was just relieved to be done with the arguing. But he divided up the estate and gave his son the part that would have been his anyway. A few days later, the, the boy packed up all of his things and walked away. He was free. Until the world proved to be a bit more challenging than that young man's inheritance was prepared for, right? He had been living large, but money ran out and he needed to find a job. Of course, that happened at the exact same moment that there was a famine and jobs, well, they were hard to come by. Finally, he took a job feeding a farmer's pigs, pigs of all things, and they ate better than he did. Luke tells us that the young man was hungry and that no one gave him anything. It's a picture of despair. But finally, Luke says he came to his senses and realized that even his father's servants had it better than he had. And he also began to realize that he had hurt his father and shamed him and that he needed to somehow make up for that mistake. It was time to set things right. Word spread quickly throughout the town. Someone traveling had seen the young man on the road headed toward home. People came out of their homes and shops and headed toward the town gates. Those who had children brought them along because today, today they were going to learn a lesson they would never forget. Today they were going to see what happened to young men who shamed their family and their village. Everyone knew what was going to happen. It was a law written long ago for a ceremony called a kazaza. The boy would walk up to the city gate. The father would stay home, refusing to even see him. 
Instead, villagers would meet him at that gate and throw a large clay pot on the ground at his feet. The pot would shatter into pieces, representing how the relationship between the father and son was now shattered as well. The villagers would turn their backs on the boy, and the boy, the former son, would turn and walk away. He wouldn't even dare enter the village that he had shamed. And so the village gathered at the gate and waited. When the father learned that the son was coming, the old man went to the gate. At first the people were confused, but then they understood that the old man, well, the old man was angry and shamed enough that he wanted to be the one to throw the pot at his son's feet. This would certainly be a lesson that the children of the village would not soon forget. When the boy was seen coming toward the gate, the crowds began to shout and taunt him, encouraging the old man to teach his son a lesson and remove the shame from their village. Luke said, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The crowd went silent. First, men do not run. It's not dignified. And then instead of fulfilling the kazaza and throwing a clay pot, the old man without hesitation welcomed him back and invited everyone to a party? Really? The townsfolk were in shock, to say the least. They pulled their children away and sent them home. No wonder this son behaved the way he did, they said. If that's the kind of father, that he had. First the son brought shame onto his own family and now his father is compounding it with his actions. The old man didn't care. We don't know how many villagers came to the party that night. All we know is that as the older son was returning from work in the fields to the house, he heard the music and the dancing. He, uh, he asked one of the servants what was going on, and he could not believe what he was told. He stood outside the house along with those in the village who were still angry about what was going on, uh, still uh, angry at the, the shame that the family was bringing upon their village. The father came out to plead with his son to come inside and welcome his brother. But he would have none of that. It's not fair, the older son said. He's brought shame on all of us. He went out and wasted everything on unclean living. And now he comes back? And you do what? You bring on even more shame to us. And while he's been gone doing that, I've been here all along working so hard. I've been doing everything right. But he's the one you throw a party for? He's the one you kill the, the, the fatted calf for? As the old man tried to explain, Luke leaves us there, leaving us wondering how things would work out. Given human nature, it probably ended like this. The older son saw that he had no choice if he was going to restore uh, and if he was going to remove the shame from his family and his village. He, he probably looked around the ground on the ground for a rock, a large rock, picked it up and threw it at his father. Others probably did the same. And then they found the younger son and did the same to him. And finally, the shame was removed. The older brother regained the family's place in the village and all was right with the world. Mm. 
We remember this story as the story of the prodigal son. This, I am afraid, is what Mary faced as well. Her family responsibility was clear, but even more, there was Joseph, her betrothed. This was something like a super engagement, right? Uh, not yet married, but certainly more than just engaged. What this meant was that if Mary was found going to have a child according to the law, then she must have committed adultery. And the punishment was clear. At best, Joseph could give her a severe beating, and then he and her family would turn her out of the village, send her away, carrying the reputation of, her, of an adulteress to spend the rest of her life unmarried, alone, living on the streets, begging at best, or maybe even worse things. Or Joseph would pick up the first stone. And Mary would be killed by her family and her village. That was the law. Joseph had no choice. And we don't know much about Joseph. We don't know how he first reacted to Mary's announcement. We can guess how the village reacted and the pressure they put on Joseph to act. But we don't know what was in his mind. We don't know, for instance, if he was relieved when the angel appeared to confirm Mary's story, or if, he was, if it was still difficult for him to get past the feeling that he had been shamed. We don't know. What we do know is that somehow Joseph and Mary found the strength to stand together and believe together that they were doing something that was bigger than the old laws. They were doing something that was more important than the stares and the jeers that they would have had to face every day from the people around them who just didn't understand. You know, as we go through this week approaching Christmas, and as we meet the people whose paths we will cross along the way, let's remember we are called to be different. Remember the story of the prodigal son. I, I actually prefer to call it the story of the prodigal father because he did the different thing, the messy thing, the better thing. And remember that young couple in Nazareth, the ones whom God honored and blessed. Back then, Everyone whispered about them as shameful people who no longer had any value or any rightful place in their community. And as you do, remember that our role is not to demand or not to determine the value of those around us and to decide whether or not we think that they are a risk to what, what, to what we believe is right and just. Friends, our role is to love God and love other people who are around us. Not, not just family or those who believe like we believe. We are to love all of them, even the Marys and the Josephs. Amen. Amen. God of peace, we see how Joseph loved Mary and willingly accepted the role as an adoptive father of Jesus and husband to Mary. We can only imagine the confusion, pressure, and insecurity that would have gone along with that decision. Joseph and Mary probably underwent criticism, challenge, and exclusion related to their decision to follow a path that honored you and was different from the ways of their community and culture. Spirit of God, you were at work and continue to work through difficult situations, situations that cause us unrest and distress. We ask for your peace, a peace that we cannot create for ourselves, but that is rooted in your being and purposes, a peace that only you can provide. As we live in a world of unrest, turmoil, and conflict, help us to not only receive your peace, but become peacemakers. We are your peculiar people 
and different followers that have different aims from our community and culture. We are in awe of the work that you have done and the work that you are doing. We look to further your work of peace on earth by acting as your agents of change. As we celebrate the holidays with our family, friends, neighbors, and coworkers, help us to find those opportunities to share the peace that we have found in you, that your purposes of peace would be evident and that it would draw people to you. Amen.